Now, how, how many are stress free right now? Yay. The shred balls aren't they helpful? And they're a good reminder. I promise you that that stress is not from the Lord. All right. 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 This morning, I want to remind you of what we spoke about last week, as well as speak to you about <coughs> loving God. What did we speak about last week? Loving yourself. And uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. We have a new trainee in, in, in the process over there, which is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> a round of applause. Oh, yeah. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? Love. Love. All right. I have that twice. I guess I gotta stress love again. Um, <clears throat> the passage that we use with the children for the children's sermon is found in First John four nineteen. We're skipping one. We're gonna go back to it in one second. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is a little rough this morning, but I promise you, I'm not as rough around the edges. And I won't be rough with you, okay? This, whatever bug I had, had in the past, because I no longer have it, right? It's really taken a, a toll on my voice. But I feel so much better this morning. Last week, I'm sure you guys saw that I wasn't my regular self. But this morning, I am hyped up a little bit, not as hyped up as I usually am, but we'll get through it in Jesus' name, right? We love because he first, he first loved, loved us. us. And last week I, I spoke to you guys about loving yourself and looking at yourself, to love yourself through the eyes of Jesus and what he has done on the cross for us. Because yet we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And when we realize that Jesus died for us, we can acknowledge ourselves, we can love ourselves. And we see ourselves through the prism of God's love. And when we look at ourselves through the prism of God's love, we're able to love ourselves. Some of us are not very lovable. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> now, can we go to 1 John chapter 5, the first five verses? <clears throat> I, again, I apologize for my voice. If it gets a little rough, Pastor Earl would pick up where I drop off, okay? <laughs> uh, but you won't drop out. Okay. <laughs> Keep praying for me. Anne has a lot of faith. I love that. Now, First John is a small uh, epistle, and it is it talks about love and how God loves us. But here, uh, in First John chapter five, the last chapter uh, of of John, there's um, like. Um, like a, like a grand finale, if you want to call it that. And it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. And now we know that every single one of you is a child of God. Next verse. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commandments. Just stop there for one second. <clears throat> Remember last week I said, we cannot learn to love God or our neighbor until we figure out how to love ourselves. And look, can you believe it? John said the same words. <laughs> and how do we love God? What does that last line say? Carry we carry out his commandments. Next verse. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commandments. And his command... We'll go back with and his commandments are not, what? They're not burdensome. Next verse. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that, that has overcome the world, even our faith. Next verse. Who is, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And to me, these just five uh, small verses just perfectly puts together what love towards God is. 
And as we, we talked about the children that I mentioned a second ago, in 1 John 4, 19, we love God because he loved us first. And how do we know that God loved us first? <coughs> how do we know? Well, I found a Bible passage that says that too. Romans 8. Oh, sorry. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can you imagine love like that? Can you imagine that? Now, as much as I love every single one of you guys here, I'm not sure that it talks about me here, because I'm not Christ. Okay? <laughs> but Christ, now Jesus Christ, Christ was not his last name. You, we, we all know that, right? Amen. I actually had somebody say, well, if Christ was his last name, why did people uh, crucify him? Christ was his title. Back then, they didn't have last names. He was known as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, when we talk about love, we need to understand that there are different love languages. How many have read the book or heard of the book by Gary Chapman that was written in 1995, The Five Languages of Love? For those of you who have not read it, read it. For those of you um, who are married, who want to get married, or just want to have good relationships, read it. It's good reading. <clears throat> and Gary Chapman, in, the, in his book, he identifies five languages of love. Anybody know them? Well, I will tell you. Words of affirmation. What are words of affirmation? Praise. Compliment. Now, I know we all love compliments. So I know for a fact that each one of, her, each one of us speaks uh, the language of love of, uh, with the words of affirmation. Now, does God need words of affirmation towards him? Well, God doesn't really need anything, to be honest with you. God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need our praise. You know who needs our praise? We do. Because when we praise God, when we praise God, we let ourselves know that we're not God. We don't look like, well, we have an image of God, but we, are not, we don't look like gods. We don't sound like God sometimes. Remember when we talk about, when we talk about loving ourselves? We're talking about that we are uh, full of sin and we're not that good. But when we praise God, we give him the glory that he deserves. You know what? If every single one of us here, for the rest of our lives, keep, kept on repeating ourselves, that Jesus, I love you, it will not be enough. Because what he, did, what he did for us, he saved us. From who? Ourselves. Now, another love language is acts of service. Now, how can you... What's an act of service that you can do towards God? Praise, worship, do it good for somebody else. We'll talk about that next week. Because next week I want to talk to you about loving your neighbor. Afterwards we will be feasting on some awesome food. I promise you the good the food's gonna be good. Has it have we ever had bad food at Living Waters? <laughs> no. We might have some extra calories. But that food was good. And also, God doesn't need our acts of service. We need our acts of service. Because, well, let's put it this way. Does my wife need flowers? No. Don't ask her, because she'll say yes. She'll say, no. <laughs> but I need to give her the flowers. Because I need to remind myself that I love her. And flowers make her happy. Now, another love language is receiving gifts. And I guarantee every single one of us here loves to receive gifts. And don't say you don't, because on Christmas I know for a fact each one of us enjoyed the gifts we got, regardless of how little they were. <clears throat> but a love language is receiving gifts. And let me tell you, God loves that language. And he gives us gifts every single morning. Because why? His mercies 
are new every single morning. Now, my kids keep reminding me about a, a sermon that I preach about time. And whenever I say, what is love? They all say, ooh, 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 time, T-I-M-E. Quality time. Now, me and my wife, <clears throat> I'm bringing my wife up a, a lot because she's not here right now. She's in, in the Sunday school class, so I can pick on her. <laughs> Don't tell her. <laughs> but quality time. You know, sometimes me and my wife, we don't have to talk. We don't, we don't have to do anything. We can just sit next to each other and just spend that time together. Of course we talk. But you don't do that? <laughs> Sorry. We just, have to, we just sit there in the quiet. Sometimes even a movie. We're not even watching the movie. We're just, we're just enjoying each other's presence. And God wants us to do that same thing with him. Amen. Just in that quiet, in the peace and quiet, and just enjoy his presence. Now, does he need that? Does he need that? No. No, we need that. When you're sitting there with your wife or your, or your husband and just enjoying each other's presence, who needs that more, you or them? You need that. When you do that, you fulfill some selfish desires by just being there with them. And God is the same way. God just wants to spend some time with you. And you need it more than God. <coughs> now, another love language, <clears throat> and I was very careful when I spoke about this on Friday night, is physical touch, embrace. Living Waters is a very affectionate group of people. When you come here, you are loved, hugged, but never never, uh, never get any bacteria. Because <laughs> when we are feeling a little, we, we apologize for not hugging you. Yes, physical touch is that important. And our church is like that. We love each other by embracing each other. So, what is the love language of God? Well, I'm sorry to say, but Gary Chapman, in his book, he did not get it. Because he was talking about people. And we know that God is not a human. 1 John 1, 6. You're good. Is that, is that Dan like that? <laughs> I run on plastic for Dan. He's that good. No. Oh. First John 1 John 1.6 <clears throat> If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. What does that mean? Well, remember when we love ourselves, we can't love ourselves because we're, when, when we really look at ourselves as who we are, as sinners, we can't, all, we can't love ourselves. But when we do have fellowship with him, and we do walk in the light, we, we can love ourselves because we see ourselves through the light of Jesus. Amen. Now in John 14, 15, we get this. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, we finally are starting to see what the love language of God is. And what does that say? Keep his commandments. Keep my commandments. So, just by looking uh, at the two passages in 1 John 1, 6, where we, when we fellowship with him, we need to walk in the light. And in uh, John 14, 15, that if you love him, you got to keep his commandments. We see that the love language of God is what? Obedience. And that's a tough word. Do you know that obedience... It's probably the least favorite word in all of English language. When Apostle Paul wrote um, for wives, wives obey your husbands, that's a tough word. 
when we read, keep my commandments, or, or, or obey, if you love me, obey me, that's a tough word. But, but uh, simply put, love for God will show itself through obedience. Now, some Christians frequently attempt to turn love uh, for God into a mushy emotional experience. But that's not what it talks about. Yes, we can feel the Holy Spirit tugging on our hearts. And yes, sometimes we get all mushy and cry. And yes, even I cry. <clears throat> Sorry for my voice again. Even I cry. But that's not, that's not what we're talking about uh, when we talk about love. Or love towards God. Or the way we love God. Again, we can look at uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And we can see that, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And in this passage, it talks about that our obedience. That's not, that's not what saves us. Our obedience is showing our love toward Him. We, can't, we cannot be saved by doing stuff. We are not... A works group. There's nothing you can do <clears throat> in your entire lifetime to earn the love of God. It's just there. And you've got to receive it by faith. Go back to verse 8. <clears throat> For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And it's not of yourself. It's a gift. Remember last week we talked about, and today we talked about with children, John 3, 16, God gave, God gave his ultimate gift. Next, um, James 2, 14. But also, when we, when we talk about faith and works, we have to keep this in mind as well. What good, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Keep that up, please. But at the same time, if we love God, but we don't do anything, do we really love Him? And I, I always love to use this example. Again, I'm bringing my wife into the picture because she's not here. But do I have to buy her flowers? No. Then why do I? Because I love her. I want to do something for her that could make her happy. Women, I know none of you like gifts. But my wife is different. She likes gifts. Man, keep that in mind. Um, women love gifts, okay? Women just love gifts. <coughs> When I buy my wife something nice, does she look at me differently? Ladies, I'm asking you. No. No. I don't believe so. Because that gift is from her, right? <laughs> and it doesn't matter if I mess up after that. Not that I'm doing it on purpose. <clears throat> but if I, if after I give her this beautiful gift, if I say something wrong, I think that gift just covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> no, don't do that. That's wrong. <laughs> don't do that. That's a bad one. But that gift that I give to my wife, whether it be flowers, a purse, a shopping spree, whatever it may be, Greg, keep that in mind. A shopping spree is amazing. Amazing things can happen in a shopping spree. Just be careful. Put a limit on there. <laughs> but the gift that I give to her is, is not to prove my love, but it's to show my love. She's still going to be my wife even if I don't buy her flowers. She will still be my wife even if I don't buy anything nice for her. She will still love me for me but that's like the cherry on top. 
Just that little bonus. That's something beautiful, an expression of love. And when, when we obey God, that's like that cherry on top. That's our, our faith walked out. Now let's go to Romans 14, <clears throat> verses 7 and 8. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. And, un, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whatever, whatever, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Keep that up, please. Again, back about my wife here. She's a great example. If I live... I live for her. If I die, I'm still hers. Same thing with God. When we are walking on this earth and we receive uh, Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we live and we die for Him. <clears throat> because what does Paul say? Whether I live or whether I die, I belong to Him. While I'm walking here, I'm walking, out his, I'm walking in His favor. When I die, I go to see Him. So whether I live or I die, I belong to him. My apologies. Thank you, Anne. You're a lifesaver. <laughs> Only the Lord saves. Amen to that. <clears throat> now, if we live and we die for him, then we, we need to give his commandments. And if we go back to 1 John 5, 3, which is the next verse in the schedule, if I, be, if I believe correctly. <clears throat> in fact, this is love for God to keep, to keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Can you keep that up, please? I want to talk to you to, uh, for just a few minutes about His commandments are not burdensome. Can I have you guys say it with me? His commandments... <laughs> Are not burdensome. And the next bullet points, bullet points I have, his commandments are not burdensome. Why? All right. Some Christians feel very burdened by the commandments of God. Yet John insists that they are not burdensome. See? His commandments are not burdensome. When we see how wise and good God's commandments are, they are gifts from him to show us the best and, mo and most fulfilling life possible. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to use this example from this morning. On my, uh, on my phone, there's this feature. It's called the alarm clock. Anybody have that on, on their phone or in their house somewhere? And on this, on this phone or alarm clock that you have in your house, there's this evil button. <laughs> Snooze. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> now, the commandment was to get up at 745. You see where I'm going with this? The commandment was to get up at 7.45. Anybody hit the snooze button this morning? It feels so right when you hit that snooze button. But snooze is a liar. It's probably the most evil invention that has ever, that has ever been invented in an alarm clock. I have a friend. I'll call him my friend. His name is Peter. He is a sinner because he keeps using that snooze button. <laughs> and I will send this video to him. <laughs> and because he loves the snooze button like I love the snooze button uh, this morning for myself, I was running a little late. How late was I running? 
Ask Bob. <laughs> he will tell you. He said, uh, Pastor, are you running a little late this morning? <laughs> now, <clears throat> any of you, when the alarm went off at 7.45 or whatever time your alarm went off, I'm just talking about my alarm clock, when you got up exactly at 7.45 when the alarm went off, any of you have regrets? Ah, oh, that five minutes would have been so good. <laughs> any of you? Any of me <laughs> that hit the snooze button twice have regrets this morning? <laughs> now, it wasn't burdensome to wake up at 7.45, but hitting that snooze button was so pleasurable for that, I don't know, two minutes or five minutes, yeah. whatever I get in my snooze button. It felt so right. Now, God has our best intentions for us. But we as humans, we like that snooze button. God, not right now, give me another five minutes. Because it feels so right in the moment. Any of you drive by Dunkin' Donuts and feel so right to just drive in and get a donut? Oh, come on. Am I, am I by myself here? Am I the only sinner here? <laughs> All right, how about when you go to a buffet? You know, the, you know that feeling when you feel full, but you already paid for an extra plate anyways? Any of you? Oh, don't raise your hands. I'm, I'm the only sinner here, I'm telling you. You guys are perfect. What can I say? But those times when it feels so right to do the wrong thing, later, it feels so wrong that you did the right thing. That felt so right at that moment. This morning, hitting that snooze button felt so right. It felt so good to get an extra, you know, one iron. Is that what you call that? It felt so good just to hit that snooze button. It feels so good to drive by Dunkin' Donuts to get that extra donut. Listen, if you buy one, might as well have, buy half a dozen, right? <laughs> but later, when you gotta pay for it, when you're, when you're not on time, as my friend Peter, whenever, whenever he's late for his deliveries, that five extra minutes that he hit the alarm clock for, it, was, it wasn't once, it was a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But waiting for his delivery the next, the next day, that, that half an hour where you kept on hitting that snooze button, it felt so right in the moment, but you gotta pay for it later. Can we say this together? His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. Because when it feels so right in the moment, if anybody ever told you that sin does not feel good in that moment, they lie to you because in that moment, sin feels so good. In that moment, and it's, it's that moment that you gotta pay for it later. Now, God commandments are like the manufacturer's handbook or instruction manual. We have Kiki here. He likes tinkering with um, cars. Have you ever looked at the manual to see how, what they're, how to put something together? Cars, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> now, if you didn't look at the manual, could you make a mistake? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, anybody go to Ikea ever to buy something at Ikea? <laughs> Did you read the manual? No. Did you make a mistake? She's, she's better than I am. Because <laughs> we men, we never read the instructions right away. Jay, do you read the instructions beforehand? Uh -huh. Amy, you have a special man. I never read the instructions beforehand. I start doing something, and when I hit a dead end, I go, I go back to the instruction manual. But here's the thing. I already made 10 steps in the wrong directions. Oh. 
So what, what do I need to do? Undo. I gotta spend the time reading like I should have in the first place. Then I gotta un undo what I've already done and do it the right way. <coughs> Wouldn't it be just easier to do it the right way the first time around? Yeah. Wouldn't it be just easier to read the instructions? How many read the Bible this week? What, what is the Bible? Instruction. Well, if, 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 yeah, if we do the acronym, basic instruction before leaving earth. Yes, it's the basic instructions before leaving earth. Now, we don't know when we leave this earth. We don't know. Because our time is in his hands. But he has left us a love letter. And if we love him, we will keep his commandments. My wife sometimes writes notes to me. Lately, she's been doing this on text messages. If I don't read the instructions when I go to Costco, what happens? We are out of milk. We have no danishes in the house. You, you see where I'm going with this? If I don't read her love letter to me, that Zupa Toscana that was so good last night would, would have been there if I didn't buy the, the heavy cream or whatever I had to buy there. Or the, the Italian sausages. It, would, it wouldn't be on my plate if I didn't read her instructions. Now in Jeremiah 31, 33, we read this. <clears throat> this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is talking about us right now. Because the law of God is written in our minds because, well, we read the Bible. We have free access to a Bible. If you don't have a physical Bible, you can get one on your iPad or iPhone or Android phone or any other phone. Even the not so smart phones <laughs> have access to a Bible. So the law of God is available to us 24 seven for free. Do you know how, <clears throat> excuse me, do you know how much was paid? Yeah. What kind of price was paid for you guys to have a Bible? When the King James Bible was written, it was written uh, on, the, on the lives of people who gave their lives. And remember a couple years ago, we, we did a whole uh, study with the children and how we got the Bible? And how many people gave up their lives? Gave up their lives to translate it into the English language or and other languages as well. Right now, there's still people translating the Bible into languages that, that, that are un, unknown to us. And some of these languages don't even have a written language. Yes. Now, when the Bible, when the, the gospel is preached to the, to, to the ends of the earth, to these people who don't even have a Bible, that's when Jesus is going to come. And there's a lot of people working very diligently to make that happen. We have lots and lots of translations. You name it, we got it. We, any, anything from the Message Bible, which is the paraphrase, to the King James, to the Old King James. If you want the Word of God, it's available to you. It's a love letter. Can we all just say, His commandments are not burdensome? His commandments are not burdensome. <clears throat> when we compare to, to them, uh, the, re the, relig the religious rule makers in Jesus' time, we can see that back then they had hundreds of commandments. Hundreds, if not thousands, of commandments. And when we compare uh, the rules that Jesus gave to the 
probably thousands of commandments that were written um, for the people back then. But even yet, even right now, people are, put, are putting themselves in bondage with human commandments. Stuff that God has never asked us to do. Has God ever asked you to climb a mountain? Barefoot? On your knees? To scuff up your, your, your feet? No. That's not a commandment. He said love each other. Now that's difficult. Some of us would rather climb barefoot on our knees uh, up a mountain to love each other. But all, all he wants us to do is to live without sin. 1 John 1 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive, we deceive ourselves and truth is not in us. If we claim to love God, yet live in sin, we're lying to ourselves. Again, remember last week I talked about loving ourselves? <clears throat> and I said that if we, if we take on a Jesus, if we believe that Jesus takes away our sin, then we, can, then we can love ourselves. And then we can love God too because we, we are no longer deceived. If we say that I can do this with the commandments that people left us, then we're lying to ourselves. Because there is nobody good. Not one. Now Matthew 23, 20, uh, 23, 4 is where I want to go next. Thank you. This is talking about the Pharisees and what they uh, did to the people back then. They said, and Jesus, Jesus wrote this, uh, they tie up heavy uh, cumbersome loads and put it on other, on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift one finger to move them. Now, if if people want you to have all uh, follow all these rules, I'm not I'm not even going to touch the subject of our government because there's plenty of rules in there that the lawmakers have, are not even willing to touch themselves. But Jesus, in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, wrote, uh, said this. Come to me. Let's read this together. Come to me, all of, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Next. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can we say it together again? His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. When we love God, we want to obey Him and we want to please Him. When I love my wife, I want to buy her flowers. She's not asking for the flowers, although she is. But I don't have to do that. I want to. When you love someone, it is not troublesome for you to do something nice to, for them. When you love God, it is not hard for, for you to obey his commandments. Love yourself, love God, and love others. That's not very difficult, is it? I, want, uh, I don't have too much time, but do you remember the story of Jacob and Rachel? He served seven years, seven years mm -hmm. to marry this girl. Now, when I get to heaven, I really want to see this girl because any, any girl that's worth serving seven years for is worth looking at. But hold on, hold on. When Laban lied to him, he was willing to serve another seven years. That's 14 years in total to marry this girl. And we're not even willing to read the Bible once in a while. Like every day. Or at least once a week. 
when when you love when you really truly love somebody, you're willing to sacrifice. When Jacob really loved Rachel, he spent 14 years, and literally slave labor. Any of you um, seen uh, shepherds out in the fields? Any of you? Any of you ever, you know, tended uh, any livestock? Some of you did. What happens? Are they all very obedient? Is it a slave labor? Or compared to slave labor? And he did that for this girl. So what is the love language of God? John, uh, oh, you're good. You are good. That was Dan. That was Dan. <laughs> A round of applause for Dan. <laughs> if you love me, <clears throat> keep my commandments. Obedience is the, is the simplest uh, love language of God. And it tells a lot. But if we love God, we will keep his commandments. We're going to end with reckless love. And I know that the word reckless isn't something that we usually use for love. And I know there's a lot of theological debate on that word reckless love of God. But let me tell you something. Dying on the cross for people who are not even in love with you yet... That could be considered reckless. Giving your one and only son for people that, to know, uh, uh, knowing that people are going to kill him, that could be considered reckless. But God so loved the world that he gave. And this morning, I want all you guys to stand right now and to give. Give him the praise. As we're singing the song, think about what he has given to you. And after the song, I want to ask another question.